Okay, today I want to share uh, some thoughts from you from Psalm 27. Um, this has been a psalm that's meant a lot to me in my life, uh, ever since I became a Christian as a teenager. And so I want to just talk about three things that David holds on to during the challenges that he's facing in his life. Three things that David holds on to, and then four ways that David builds his confidence in who God is. So first I just want to talk about these three things, and we'll look at Psalm, we'll kind of look at the whole psalm, uh, 1 through 13, but I'll just hit verses as we go. Uh, the first verse is, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom, of whom shall I be afraid? So the first thing that David thinks about when he thinks about God in this psalm is the Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. Okay, kids on the front row, can I ask you a question? Okay. What's, just tell me something, you can just yell these out. I'm sorry my microphone is banging, I must not have it on my head right. Um, uh, what are some things you're afraid of? Anything that you're afraid of? The dark? Okay, good. Anything else? Yeah? Bad guys, very good. Okay, anything else? Spiders, very good, yes. You don't like spiders. Anything else you're afraid of? Scorpions, wow. And what else? Snakes, very good. Anything else? Sharks, yeah, good. What? Poison dart frogs. And heights, yeah, you know what? I am terrified of heights. Anything else? Roller coasters, tornadoes, somebody said. I've got a story about that later. Uh, yeah, anything else? The mamba? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, that's good. Listen, you know what? Um, one in 10 Americans, there was a survey done uh, about what Americans fear. One in 10 Americans are afraid of the dark. So whoever said the dark right at the beginning, you're not alone. Uh, spiders, 30% of Americans, one of three Americans are afraid of spiders. Uh, lots of people are afraid of heights. Uh, fear of death is big. And what I'm doing right now, public speaking, is a big fear for folks. But the point here is, is that David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. There is something about the darkness that's scary because we don't know what's out there. There could be bad guys out there in the darkness. Um, in the ancient world, they didn't have electricity, so they had, some, they had torches and they had um, oil lamps that they could use to light their way, but that didn't give a lot of light. So in the ancient world, when it was dark, it was dark. About 10 years ago, I got to go to Rwanda, uh, and I was there with my bishop, Jeffrey Rubusasi, and uh, in his area, we're in far, let's see, far western Rwanda, uh, right by the Congo, and at nighttime, about 7 o'clock, it's on the equator, so at 7 o'clock, it's just black, dark, kind of like it's getting to be, it'll be here in about a month here in the Midwest. It's dark, and you can't see anything. Like, we had electricity in our little Anglican compound that we were in, but every place else, it is just dark. And Jeffrey, our bishop, said, Rwanda is very, very safe during the daytime, very, very safe. Do not go out after dark. There are bad guys. He said, there are bandits. And bandits will get you. They will hurt you. Do not go out after dark. So David's saying, the Lord is my light. He's my salvation. I don't have to be afraid of the dark because I have the light of God with me. I have the light in my life. Last weekend, uh, I was driving up to preach in a church in St. Joe, Missouri. It was dark when I left. Uh, I left early. Um, and as I was driving up I-435, the sunlight, uh, the sunrise started to come from the east, and you could literally just, it felt like the light was chasing away the darkness. And that is what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to be a light for us. He wants to chase away the darkness. Anytime we go through conflict and struggle and stress, there's a tendency to feel like there's just sort of darkness kind of caving in around you, and God wants to be our light in those times. He wants to radiate and send away the darkness. He wants to provide um, the ability to see the path ahead of us. He wants to reveal any evil that is around us. So he wants to be our light and our salvation. That's the second thing. David says, the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The image here is that he takes out the bad guys, that he, he protects David and takes care of, in a bad way, the enemy, takes, you know, gets them out of the way. You know, I don't think there's any mistake in our culture that so many of us love superhero movies. Have any of you guys seen a superhero movie? Yeah. What was the last one you saw? Superman. 
Avengers. Okay, there's a good. You're just you're helping my talk. Avengers made 1.4 billion dollars worldwide. 1.4 billion dollars. Why is that? I think it's because it resonates in the soul of all of us that there, we hope good guys prevail over the bad guys. We hope there is a salvation when bad things come. And David is saying, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation when evil things happen. He's the one I'm looking to to save me. In fact, he says here in verse 2, when evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Look, David isn't saying God's going to save me and so there's never evil people around me. God's going to save me so there'll never be war. He's saying when there is war, I'm counting on God to save me somehow. When there are evil people trying to get me, I'm counting on God to deliver me somehow. That's what David is saying. So he says, I'm looking to the Lord as my light and my salvation. That way I don't have to be afraid. I'm trusting him. But he's capable somehow of saving me. Then one more thing he says about God. He says, my life, he's my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. Of whom shall I be afraid? The word stronghold in the ancient world meant fortified city. So picture a city like, uh, with a great big wall around it. And if you were traveling and there were bandits coming after you or there was an army coming after you, if you could get to the walled city, you would probably be safe, or at least you'd fare a lot better than you would out in the open plain. Okay? So David is saying, when I need something, when I'm in conflict and stress, when people are coming to get me, the Lord is my safe place. Now, in our culture today, we don't have fortified cities in the same way they did in the ancient world. Um, but you know what we do have? We have basements. When I was a kid about five years old, uh, I was in downtown Overland Park on Santa Fe and uh, 79th and Santa Fe. Uh, there was a little shoe store there, um, and I was getting shoes with my mom. Has any, does anybody remember that in this room? Anybody around since 19, I was born in 1958. Okay, so I was in downtown Overland Park. I was outside. It was, there was a blue sky, uh, and it was raining. And I thought that was kind of cool. I'd never seen that, blue sky and raining. So I was kind of outside playing, and my mom was inside. I don't know what she was doing. She comes outside and she says, Jay, get in the car. And so I'm still playing in this kind of odd thing of rain in the blue sky. And she says, get in the car. And I still don't get in the car. And finally she says, Jay, get in the car, look. And she points back behind me. And I turn around and there's this black sky and this giant thing that looked like a big finger coming out of the sky. It was a tornado. And so I was terrified. <laughs> so I obeyed my mom. I got in the car. And we started driving down 79th Street, east on 79th Street, toward our house. And what my mom says is, we got to get home. Because I knew that if we, and she knew, if we could get to our basement, we would be OK. We would have a better chance of surviving a tornado. right? So we drove down there. And my mom stopped at the corner of 79th and Lamar, uh, which was a stop sign then. And we, had, we didn't have air conditioning in our car. So our windows were down. Some other guy was in a truck, a pickup truck, and my mom leans her head out the window and says, excuse me, is that a tornado? <laughs> There's this great big tornado. And the man says to her, it sure is, ma'am, and you better keep driving. <laughs> so we were headed to our safe place, our basement. Okay, by the time we got to our house, the, the tornado had, whatever they call it, had lifted back up. So, and it was a tornado that hit, uh, I think it was Catherine Carpenter School out by Oak, Oak Park. Uh, back, I don't know what year that was, like 63 or something. Anyways, for David, when I have calamities happening, when I have enemies closing in around me, when I'm going through conflict and strife, the Lord is my basement. That's where I go. I go to him for my safe place. And he is my safe place. He's my stronghold. Now, I believe that David did four key things to build his confidence that God was his light, his salvation, and his stronghold. And I want to share those four things with you that we see here in the psalm. I'm just telling you what David says here in the psalm. I'm not trying to be smart or anything. This is what David says in the psalm. The first thing he says, um, well, the first thing he does is he looks to God first in his life. He's just always looking to God first. That's his main place he wants to keep his attention. Sure, there's stuff going on. If you read the life of David in the book of um, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, he has a, a life filled with conflict, great glory, but lots of conflict, lots of people trying to kill David. OK, 
Okay? Um, so here's what he does in his life. He says, I try to look to God first. It's one thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. In the ancient world, the, God was in the temple. That's where God dwelt. And so David's saying, I just want to be in the presence of God. I want to be close to God. I've got this uh, golden retriever, Cooper, and um, I don't really like animals that much. They're hairy. I, I do the vacuuming. I'm, it just seems like I'm constantly vacuuming up things, picking up, throw up, all that kind of stuff that comes from animals. My wife loves, loves animals, and so do my kids. So I've got this dog, and, I, and when I'm home by myself, bless his heart, he follows me around and lays wherever I am. I mean, he's very endearing, I have to say. He wants to be around me. And what David is saying is, I want to be around God. All the time, I want to be around God. Now, for him, that meant to go to the temple. For, this, for us, it means to be aware of God in our life, to just be contemplating him. As he says, to, to gaze upon his beauty. Well, how do we do that? How can we gaze upon the beauty of the Lord? Well, I think verse 6, he says, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. You know, one of the ways we can be in the presence of God is to sing, is to enjoy music that's oriented toward him like we just were this morning. Just spending some time singing those incredible hymns and thinking about those words and thinking about God, that's, the way, that's a way to be with the Lord, to look to him first. We can, we can be with Christ through just fellowship with each other, uh, encouraging each other. We can be with him, with God, through his word by reading the scriptures. We can be with God by contemplating how amazing it is that he sent his son to die for us, like we're celebrating on this Reformation Sunday. That it's not anything that I've done, that he's just loved me in spite of everything I've done and sent his son to die for us. Just contemplating that is to be in his presence. Uh, during Good Friday this year, I was at a, I, I went to the church that I go to, and they had a Good Friday service. And um, to be completely honest, I was kind of down in the dumps that day. Um, I, uh, I won't even go into it. But I was down in the dumps, right? And so I, I didn't really even want to go to the service. And, but I went, and um, during the service, they would just read a Bible passage about Jesus' death and everything that led up to it, the betrayal. And then we'd sing a song. And then we'd read a Bible verse. And then we'd sing a song. And you guys, I don't know what happened to me, but somehow I felt the presence of God so powerfully as I thought through everything that happened to Jesus, all the negative things that happened to him, all the conflict, all the strife, the betrayal, and then the beatings, and then the crucifixion. And I just felt his presence so much in that worship service that honestly, I didn't want it to be over. Have you ever felt God's presence that clearly, that powerfully, that palpably? That you thought, I don't want this to be over. I can tell God's alive. I can tell he loves me. And I never want this to stop. That's what David's saying. The one thing, if you could ask me one thing I want, I want that. I want that moment when I really know God loves me deep in my soul and it moves me. I want that moment every second I can have it. So he looks to God first in his life. The other thing he does is he obeys the, God's prompts. Look at this verse here, verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. You know, I believe if you have asked Christ in your life, his spirit lives inside you, and God wants to speak to you. He likes to tell us stuff. He gives us these little nudges in the right direction. And David's saying, you know, every once in a while, when my heart says seek God, I obey it and I seek him. The point here is, if God nudges you toward himself, if God said, you know, you got to read your Bible. You ever had a little nudge? Like, you know how to read my Bible. You know, or like, you know, I ought, to, I ought to spend some time praying. Or, you know, maybe I should call this person. And, or maybe, maybe I should be serving more. Gosh, maybe I should be more generous. Or, you know, maybe I need to help out at church. Let me tell you something. The voice that says those things is not Satan. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit nudging you, prompting you. And David's saying, when the Spirit, when God prompts me, I obey that. I do seek him. So the point here is simply that. When God prompts you, when God gives you a little nudge in his direction, obey that. Follow.
follow that. Do what he's asking you to do. Another thing that helps David build his confidence in God as his light and salvation and stronghold, I believe is when he reveals his heart completely to God. He finds that God's a safe place to share his heart. The first thing it says here is, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God of my Savior. You know, David's afraid God might be mad at him. But he reveals that to God. You know, I think a lot of people don't talk to God because they're afraid God's mad at them. But you know what David does? He just comes before God. He says, look, you, you might be mad. Please don't turn away in anger. So he reveals his heart to God. And instead of making that a barrier, oh, God doesn't want to hear from me, you know, lightning might strike if I ever pray or something like that. Just go to him and say, Lord, I know, I feel, you, I probably deserve your wrath. I know I do. But please don't turn your face from me. So one thing he reveals to God is his spiritual concerns, his spiritual fears. The other thing he does is he reveals to God his concerns on a, on a human level. He says, do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. He tells God what he's afraid of. He just lays it out there. Man, I'm afraid these people are going to hurt me. And he just puts that out there to God. One way to build our confidence that God really is good is to share our hearts, our spiritual concerns, our, our problems with God, and our problems with each other. And I know you guys have been doing that a lot as a church, just as you've been going through this whole crisis. I know you've been praying a lot. And again, to whatever degree you've done that, I just commend you. That's the right thing to do. Reveal your heart. Tell God everything. And then lastly, and I think this is probably most important, is David dares to believe that God's goodness will prevail. David dares to believe that God's goodness will prevail. He says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, you guys have taken this giant step um, to follow God and to be, obey him as a church. And you know what? God's going to do something great and good. In 2000, I was an Episcopal priest, and my church, the Episcopal church, signed a resolution that I couldn't follow. Uh, and in our deal, I, I pledge my obedience to my bishop. That's how we do it as Anglicans. And my bishop was part of signing a document that said, essentially, it's just as good for people to live together as it is for them to be married. And I did not agree with that. And so... Uh, I prayed a lot. I sought counsel like you guys did. Our elders gathered around, and I told them I could no longer submit to my bishop. Um, so I, I was at the point, and I sought a lot of counsel. I didn't do this independently, but I said, I feel like I need to not be a part of the Episcopal thing. And they said, well, we, you know, we've just been waiting for you to say that. So they, said, so they, they were, I think, tired of it before I was. Um, so, you know, I went to my bishop and everything, and it, and it got extremely ugly. I got, I got defrocked, and, um, which is dumb, because I was still an Anglican. I went under the Anglican Archbishop of Rwanda. But in America, they, they wanted to humiliate us, and so that was bad. And they sent these mean letters, and they wrote a letter about me, and it had to be read in every Episcopal church in western Missouri. And then the, the, the Bishop of Kansas thought that might be a good idea, so he put it in his newsletter. So it went to all the Episcopalians in Kansas and Missouri knew what a bad boy I had been. And so... It was just humiliating. And we took this big step. We, we left uh, the play. We, we were meeting in Barstow High School, and then we moved over to Leewood Middle School. Um, and it was hard. But you know what was cool? Is that some of our very best years of ministry were those, um, those immediate years, like kind of like a five-year stretch. Because you know what? We knew what the main thing was. The main thing is Jesus Christ. The main thing is him, right? And God did so many cool things by our willingness to just humbly follow him. So we dared to believe, and I encourage you to continue to believe, dare to believe that you'll see God's goodness in the land of the living. Certainly we'll see his goodness in glory and in heaven, but he likes to show us his goodness even now. And he will show you his goodness as a congregation, as a church, and he'll show you his goodness as an individual, regardless of what you're facing on a personal level. He likes to show his goodness often in surprising ways. Now, when Jesus showed up a couple thousand years after David wrote his psalm, um, actually about a thousand years after David wrote his psalm, these words that David uttered are fulfilled in Jesus' own voice. Jesus says, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says that he's our salvation. He says the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And Jesus is our safe place. He says, Father, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. So all this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let me just wrap up then by giving you these four things that, D, that David did to just build confidence that God really was his light, his salvation, and his strong place. He looks to God first, above and before everything else. He obeys the prompts that God gives him to seek him. He reveals his heart completely to God, and he dares to believe that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that's what I think God wants us to do as well. Let's pray.